good to see everyone. Uh, before we get to it, uh, let me just uh, say um, uh, just a moment of personal privilege to say thank you for everyone uh, who reached out uh, with the warm wishes and, and regards over the past couple weeks. I, I very much uh, appreciate it. I uh, want to also be sure to thank uh, my team and others in the department uh, who were um, uh, in a position to <laughs> stand up uh, so I could take a step back um, for, for a couple days. Uh, the past 10 days uh, have not always been fun, but I'm extraordinary, extraordinarily grateful um, to have uh, the team around me to be able to work with uh, all of you, and also extraordinarily grateful to have benefited from safe and effective vaccines uh, that I know prevented um, serious illness uh, in, in this case. So uh, now we'll make the pivot from public health to uh, foreign policy, have just a couple elements uh, at the top. Today I have the pleasure of welcoming the Special Envoy to Advance the Human Rights of LGBT, LGBTQI plus persons, Jessica Stern, to the department as she officially assumed her duties late last month. This appointment reflects the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to advance and to protect the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons at home and abroad. Prior to joining the department, Special Envoy Stern served as Executive Director of Outright Action International, based in New York, where she specialized in gender, sexuality, and human rights globally. At Outright, she helped register LGBTQI plus organizations internationally, secure the mandate of the United Nations Independent Expert on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity, expand the UN General Assembly resolution to include gender identity, and found, uh, founded the UN LGBTQ, LGBTQI core group. You can read her full biography on the department's website. We look forward to working with Special Envoy Stern as she leads department efforts to advance the administration's priorities. And that includes pursuing an end to violence and discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, and sex characteristics. Finally, we are concerned and disappointed by recent reports from Tunisia on infringements of, on freedom of the press and expression and the use of military courts to investigate civilian cases. It is essential for the Tunisian government to uphold its commitments to respect human rights as outlined in the Tunisian constitution and affirmed in presidential decree 117. We also urge Tunisia's president and new prime minister to respond to the Tunisian people's call for, for a clear roadmap for a return to a transparent democratic process involving civil society and diverse political voices. Uh, so with that, happy to uh, turn to your questions. Start wherever, Matt, uh, Sean. Sure. All right, I called you Matt. I, 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 I won't say imitate. Yeah, um, please. I, I, hope, I hope you don't. <laughs> um, perhaps start in Iran. Sure. Um, just a couple of elements there. Uh, Reb Mali um, apparently talked today with a senior official from South Korea. Um, this comes as South Korea, the Republic of Korea, is in a dispute <coughs> with Iran over some seven billion dollars in, in frozen assets. Uh, was this the topic of the discussion? Do you see any headway on that? Well, uh, so Special Envoy Mal Mali did, in fact, uh, have a conversation with his uh, counterpart in South Korea. Uh, this is not the first conversation they've had. Special Envoy Mali uh, routinely speaks to uh, his counterparts in the uh, P5 uh, plus one, uh, as well as in other uh, parts of the world. And this includes in the Indo-Pacific uh, with our uh, ROK allies uh, in, this, in this regard. Uh, they spoke, and uh, Rob issued a tweet on their uh, conversation to confirm uh, it took place. The ROK has been uh, a stalwart um, partner, the ROK, and, and we see eye to eye when it comes to the utility of a mutual return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA. Uh, when it comes to the issue you referenced, uh, we appreciate uh, the ROK's uh, vigorous uh, enforcement of uh, existing sanctions. Uh, those sanctions do uh, remain in effect, as you know, until and unless uh, we are able to reach uh, that mutual return to compliance. So the seven billion is still, there has been no movement on that, basically it's still there. I don't have any update on that, that's right. Uh, can I ask you something else on Iran before? Sure. Um, just on, um, you've been asked this many times before, but in terms of the resumption of indirect talks in Vienna, an Iranian official yesterday, I believe it was, said could resume within days. Um, do you have any uh, anything to say on that in terms of anything? Well, we, we have heard similar statements from uh, the Iranian government at various levels uh, over the past couple of weeks. If you recall, we were talking about this in New York, uh, which seems like uh, it was just last week, um, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago now. Uh, and we have heard from the Iranians that uh, they expect negotiations to resume soon. Uh, we hope their definition of soon 
matches our definition of soon. Uh, we would like negotiations to resume in Vienna as soon as possible. We have been saying this uh, not for weeks now, but for months now. Uh, we think it is important for the parties to come back together, uh, to continue to resume where we left off uh, in Vienna after the sixth round uh, so that we can resume uh, this seventh round on the basis of what we have accomplished uh, to date. Uh, we think it is important for a number of reasons, but also because, as we have made very clear, uh, we continue to believe the diplomatic path is open. We continue to believe that a diplomatic approach is the best means to verifiably once again ensure that Iran can never obtain a nuclear weapon uh, with the uh, permanent and verifiable restrictions uh, that the JCPOA put in place. Uh, but we also think a imminent return to Vienna uh, is necessary because this is not a process that can go on indefinitely. Uh, this is not a process uh, that can drag out or that can be dragged out. Uh, we are um, firmly of the belief uh, that we need to work quickly, we need to work with alacrity and a great deal of speed uh, to see to it if we can achieve uh, that mutual return to compliance uh, that we have been sincere and steadfast uh, in seeking to achieve uh, for the better part of a year now. Hinging on what? I mean, who's it's going hinging to take, on the Iranians. Who's going to take it, the it, is, it is hinging on the Iranians. We have made very clear uh, that we are prepared, willing, and able to return to Vienna uh, as soon as we have a partner to negotiate with indirectly. Uh, we have also made clear uh, that we would be happy uh, to engage in direct negotiations. And in fact, this process would uh, be much more effective uh, if we had a direct negotiating partner. Uh, the Iranians have not been willing to do that, as we know. Uh, the Iranians have heretofore not been willing uh, to return to uh, Vienna just yet. We have heard these repeated statements of soon, of within days. Again, uh, we hope their lexicon uh, matches ours when it comes to this. Andrea. Thank you, and we're all really happy to see you well. You. It's a great advertisement for vaccinations. Yes. Thank you. Um, on Iran, can you expand on the conversations between the Secretary and Foreign Minister Lavrov in terms of what the Russians are willing to do, if they are, to help persuade the Iranians to come back to the talks? And I have a follow-up. Well, the Secretary did not have an opportunity to speak to Foreign Minister Lavrov yesterday. The, the brunt of the conversation was on uh, the um, uh, mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. Uh, we have, the, of course, it goes without saying, uh, we have a number of profound uh, disagreements uh, with the Russian, Russian Federation. There are areas where our interests do align, uh, and this is one of them. Uh, Russia, the Russian Federation, is an original member of the P5 plus one. Uh, Russia has been constructive uh, in its engagement uh, in the context of the P5 plus one. We agree with the Russian Federation uh, that Iran should not be able to uh, acquire a nuclear weapon. Uh, that is precisely why uh, we and the Russians um, agree on this one issue, um, that uh, we should resume negotiations uh, in Vienna as soon as possible. Um, uh, the Russians uh, similarly read out this call, uh, made similar points. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of those issues where our interests uh, do, in fact, overlap. And there was a number of years ago, there were a number of conversations before the JCPOA about the Russians being involved in a deal with the Iranians on buying some of their processed uranium. Is, is there any thought of that, of the Russians stepping in in any way? Uh, well, right now the thought is on uh, resuming uh, the mutual compliance with the JCPOA, uh, testing the proposition that we can achieve uh, that mutual return to compliance. The United States, the Russian Federation, uh, our other partners in the P5 plus one context, all of us are united in the belief uh, that the JCPOA continues to provide uh, the best and the most effective framework uh, for achieving our mutual interests. Uh, it is a mutual interest on the part of the United States, of France, of Germany, of the United Kingdom, of the European Union, uh, <coughs> of Russia and China, uh, that Iran should not be able to acquire a nuclear weapon. Uh, so, look, we're uh, not entertaining 
uh, at the moment, uh, or at least not discussing publicly um, uh, other modalities, other alternatives, uh, because we still have a framework in the form of the JCPOA uh, that would provide precisely what we would like to see, precisely what our partners and allies in the P5 plus one would like to see, and uh, what Iran uh, was willing to agree to um, as recently as uh, 2015, implementation in 2016, uh, and certainly uh, the last government in Iran uh, being willing to engage uh, in good faith, business-like, indirect, but business-like negotiations uh, in Vienna. That's what we would like to see happen to see if we can affect that mutual return to compliance. Yes. Anything else on Iran? Sure. Another question on another topic. Um, uh, the Namazi, I saw the uh, the tweet um, earlier this yes. week. Are you getting any indications that Iran is going to um, offer any kind of humanitarian gesture on that case? Well, uh, this these are cases uh, that I will say a couple things about. These are cases that, in the first instance, uh, we are prioritizing um, to the utmost degree. Uh, this is something we have done in parallel, um, but independently uh, of discussions regarding a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA, precisely because uh, we do not want or wish to tie, potentially tie the fates of detained Americans and, other, uh, and others uh, to uh, the fate of a proposition that has always been uncertain. We want to see these Americans released. They have been held against their will for far too long. Uh, they, the fact that they have been held against their will unjustly, uh, without basis, without cause, uh, for uh, this period, uh, for any period, uh, is uh, an abomination. It is especially jarring in this case, in the case of Mr. Namazi, uh, given the serious uh, medical condition uh, that he has, his need uh, to receive urgent uh, medical care. And so we are appealing, and we have appealed, uh, to the Iranian government uh, to do what is right, to do what is just, to do what is humane uh, in this and in, in all cases, and to uh, release Mr. Namazi and the other uh, unjustly detained uh, Americans uh, in their custody. Um, we have long made the point that using human beings, individuals, for political leverage has no place uh, in foreign policy. It has no place in the international system. It does not afford any country, whether that is Iran or any other country, uh, any additional leverage. Uh, and in fact, uh, it just uh, leads to uh, international condemnation. Uh, we have worked closely uh, with a number of our allies and partners uh, we've recently spoken to this in the Canadian context, and in fact, our Canadian allies uh, have launched an initiative uh, to uh, establish a norm to see to it that the practice of holding individuals uh, for the purposes of political leverage is something that is cast aside, uh, is something that no country uh, resorts to. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do. We are working this in the case of Iran. We are working this uh, in the case of all other countries where this occurs. Same question, but I can come back after. Sure. Uh, okay, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, good to see you. Yes, Welcome back. Thank you. Um, so the secretary is in Mexico tomorrow, and he will be talking about uh, security <clears throat> arrangements. The Mexicans say maybe that is dead. This uh, agreement that has been sort of the bedrock of U.S.-Mexican security relations for more than a decade is dead. Do you agree that, uh, do you, the State Department, the Biden administration, agree that Merida is dead, or at least has outlived its, its usefulness, A, and B, as you negotiate a new arrangement, what are the two or three um, elements that the U.S. really wants to see in any kind of future um, security arrangement with Mexico? Well, as you alluded to, the Secretary will be in Mexico tomorrow on Friday to take part in this high-level security dialogue. He'll be there. Uh, with his counterparts from the Department of Justice, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, the Attorney General, and the uh, Homeland Security uh, Secretary to discuss uh, precisely uh, this set of issues. When it comes to Merida, um, look, this is uh, an initiative that has been on the books for, I think it is 13 years now. Uh, we believe we are due for an updated look 
at our bilateral security cooperation. Uh, and it, we need uh, a, an approach that addresses the concerns and the priorities of both governments. And this will really be uh, one of the core elements of the discussions tomorrow. Uh, our foreign assistance has supported deeper law enforcement assistance and coordination and informa informa information sharing uh, between our countries, and it, hel it has helped uh, strengthen um, ties between uh, our uh, security agencies uh, and uh, help strengthen that security relationship more broadly. Uh, we also know that the Merida Initiative uh, helped Mexico strengthen rule of law and counter narcotics capacity uh, and has enabled Mexican law enforcement agencies international accreditation at the federal and state levels, resulting in increased transparency, professionalization uh, of institutions and respect for human rights. Uh, and our security cooperation has strengthened as, as th threats from fentanyl and illicit uh, finance has uh, evolved. So all of this will be on the table and more uh, tomorrow will be uh, on the table. The Merida Initiative uh, has produced some significant gains. Uh, we want to see to it that those gains are preserved, that that cooperation uh, is deepened, uh, and that uh, we have an updated approach that accounts for uh, the threats of today and the threats that have evolved uh, over the course of the some 15 years that Merida has been in place. Yes? Those gains, but uh, in perhaps a new uh, forum or a new agreement. We, we don't have anything to announce yet in terms of uh, what that might look like, what that might mean, um, but certainly uh, we want to see to it that uh, our mutually beneficial cooperation uh, with Mexico uh, continues on these important security matters. The high-level security dialogue tomorrow uh, will be the natural complement to the economic dialogue that took place with uh, our Mexican uh, uh, partners uh, a couple weeks ago now. You had an opportunity to hear from the Secretary yesterday just how productive uh, those discussions were on the economic front. Uh, I know that the Secretary, uh, I know that our counterparts from DHS and the Department of Justice uh, are uh, similarly hoping and expecting uh, for uh, a constructive discussion on the security issues uh, tomorrow in an effort to deepen that cooperation further. Said. Thank you. I'll add my voice to my colleagues and welcoming you and seeing you behind Thanks very much. The, the podium there. A uh, very quick couple of questions on the Palestinian-Israeli issue. The Israeli press reported yesterday that the Biden administration is quietly and behind the scenes is putting pressure on the Israeli government to free settlements. You know, there was a big, I guess, plan or a huge plan <coughs> or a huge settlement. Can you comment on this? Do you guys, uh, what is your position on the settlement? Well, uh, part of your question I will comment on, part of your question I won't comment on. Uh, I'll start with the latter. Uh, we don't comment on private diplomatic conversations, private conversations that may be taking place, uh, whether that's between uh, the secretary and his counterpart and the president uh, and his counterpart. Uh, but what we have said many times before is that we believe it is critical for all parties to refrain from unilateral steps that exacerbate tensions and undercut efforts to advance a negotiated two-state two solution. Uh, that, of course, includes uh, settlement activity. You know, I mean, you, you guys have always stuck to this line, you know, about you know anything that would prejudice the two-state solution outcome and so on. But in fact, you say unilateral steps. We're talking about one side who is doing this, which is Israel. It is taking the land. It is throwing people out. It is making, uh, you know, the two-state outcome almost impossible. So, why? What is there left for the United States to do in order to pressure Israel to to end these activities that actually render the two-state solution almost impossible to attain? It, Saeed, the two-state solution is something we discuss with our Israeli partners uh, at just about every opportunity. Uh, it continues to be the guiding principle uh, for our approach uh, to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And it continues to be uh, the guiding principle, the guiding framework for uh, a simple reason. Uh, the two-state solution uh, is the mes best means by which to protect Israel's identity as a Jewish and democratic state uh, while affording to the Palestinian people uh, what they have long sought. Uh, and that includes uh, uh, self-determination, uh, dignity, um, safety, security, uh, prosperity uh, in a state of their own. Uh, and so that is why we've, we've remained focused on this. Look, we don't always, and in fact, we never uh, read out our private uh, diplomatic uh, 
uh, conversations, the back and forth uh, we have, whether that's with our Israeli partners or any partner uh, around the world. But suffice to say, uh, we have made our position uh, very clear. And when, when it comes to unilateral action like settlement activity, uh, we have also made that very clear. And in fact, I just reiterated uh, where the United States uh, stands on settlement activity. There should be no question about that. Last thing on the settler, settler violence. Uh, it is, I know you guys addressed that last week, uh, but this has increased. I mean, they, the settlers are not deterred. The Israeli government is not doing, the Israeli forces are not doing anything. They just watch as they attack <coughs> today. They attack the seven-year-old girl. I mean, it's happening every single day. They're throwing people out and so on. Why can't you take a stronger stand on settler violence? Said, I think we have taken a strong stand on, on settler violence. And, and you saw our statement uh, the other day. Uh, we made very clear uh, in that statement that the United States government, that this administration strongly condemns the acts of settler violence that took place against Palestinians in villages near Hebron and the West Bank on September 28th. We appreciate uh, Foreign Minister Lapid and other Israeli officials' strong and unequivocal condemnations, condemnation of this violence. Uh, and again, look, we believe it is critical for all parties to refrain from those unilateral steps that exacerbate tensions and, again, undercut efforts to achieve a negotiated two-state solution. Uh, that includes, as I was saying before in a different context, annexation of territory, settlement activity, demolitions and evictions, incitement to violence, and providing compensation for individuals impr imprisoned uh, for acts of terrorism. Uh, we have been very clear uh, all, on all of those things, just as we were uh, on the settler violence that you referenced uh, within recent days. Yes, Can Michelle. Sure. Senator Blumenthal says that um, two charter flights have left Mazari Sharif and made it to Doha with 800 um, Americans and Afghan allies. I wonder, one, what role the, US, the State Department played in any of that, and <clears throat> two, how many um, Americans do you think are still in need of evacuation? Well, um, let me start with that second question first. This is a figure that continues uh, to be dynamic, uh, and it continues to be dynamic because uh, it's a number that goes down uh, with each flight, with each overland transfer, uh, with each departure. Uh, of uh, a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent resident uh, from Afghanistan for those who uh, wish to do so. Uh, it also uh, goes up because, especially uh, in, in recent weeks, because we have uh, been quite successful um, with our efforts to facilitate the departure of Americans and lawful permanent residents and others uh, who wish to depart Afghanistan. Uh, you've seen that in the context of uh, the flights that have departed from Kabul International Airport. Uh, you referenced uh, some of the private uh, charter flights as well. Uh, I made a reference to uh, overland transfers uh, uh, additionally. Since August 31st, uh, we have assisted 105 U.S. citizens and 95 lawful permanent residents uh, to depart. Um, an additional number of U.S. citizens and LPRs have departed on charter uh, on charters or have independently uh, on their own crossed a land border. Uh, those those figures that I start, that I cited, 105 uh, citizens and 95 lawful permanent residents. Those are individuals that the United States government uh, directly uh, facilitated whose departure uh, they uh, directly we directly uh, facilitated. I should say. Um, when it comes to the uh, issue of of charters. Uh, we are not in a position to confirm uh, private charters uh, that depart Kabul and uh, that depart uh, Kabul or Mazar Sharif, as the case might be, um, uh, because of operational security considerations, uh, because um, of our desire um, not to um, in any way impede uh, such operations. Um, but let me make a couple broad points. Uh, when it comes to private efforts uh, to facilitate the departure of Americans, of lawful permanent residents, and others uh, from Afghanistan, there are really two elements uh, to relocating uh, these uh, groups of people. One, there is arranging uh, the departure and safe passage out of Afghanistan. Uh, but there is also the issue of where these individuals can go temporarily, uh, as well as eventually, uh, to resettle permanently. Uh, and when it comes to the Department of State, 
uh, we have been working very closely with the Department of Defense uh, and other interagency uh, partners, as well as with uh, many of these outside groups and entities to evaluate requests for assistance on a case-by-case -case basis to support these privately organized flights. This support takes any number of forms, uh, but it does involve evaluating the passenger manifests provided to us uh, by the private groups or uh, by the private group or, or groups, as the case might be, uh, organizing these, flight, these flights to see which proposed passengers, if any, may be potentially eligible for permanent resettlement uh, in the United States through some affiliation uh, with the U.S. government. Uh, now, in many cases, and you have heard this uh, from uh, many of these private groups, we have um, provided that uh, direct and effective uh, assistance. Again, we don't confirm on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but uh, many of the groups have spoken uh, to our assistance uh, and support. That is not to say that these private charters are not without challenge. And we've also spoken of the challenges that uh, these present. Uh, we've made the point that without personnel on the ground uh, in Mazari Sharif, uh, in, in this case, it is, uh, we are unable to ensure the fidelity of intended manifests. Uh, and there is no ability on the part of the US government directly to determine whether the passengers aboard the plane uh, would be eligible for relocation or for resettlement uh, in the United States. Now, there have been several instances in which private entities have chartered aircraft to transport individuals out of Afghanistan uh, where identity checks on arrival at transit destinations have revealed that many of the passengers were not, in fact, eligible for relocation in the United States, and in some cases, uh, that despite the, our best um, vetting and uh, vetting to the best of our uh, ability, uh, the manifests were not accurate. Um, and when this happens, it does put these individuals uh, in a very difficult spot. Um, it puts them at risk with no plan for relocation to the United States. Uh, it has the potential we are cognizant of the fact that it has the potential to damage the bilateral relationship uh, when it involves uh, landing in a, a third country, as it, as it does in these cases. Uh, and it makes it more difficult uh, for the U.S. government to rely on partner countries to assist in future relocations out of Afghanistan. So that is why uh, we go to great and I would say extraordinary efforts uh, on the front end, working with groups or uh, individual groups um, to do all we can um, to vet manifests on the front end, uh, to provide each and every form of assistance we can, uh, to see to it that uh, where uh, there are manifests, where we feel uh, we have a good sense of the fidelity of that manifest, and that manifest uh, provides us uh, with an ability to relocate, um, to move many of these people through uh, the system and ultimately to relocate them to the United States, uh, we have been in a position to provide that assistance uh, on any number of occasions. Um, but again, uh, we just don't speak about individual flights um, for, for that reason. So uh, sticking with Afghanistan, um, uh, Afghanistan. Afghanistan, we'll come back to Mexico. Could you answer a question about sure. how many Americans do you think are left since you've taken 100 out and you were telling us about 100 were there, but that number changes. And then if you are facilitating <coughs> To the extent that you just talked about trying to validate these passenger manifests, and, and I, you said before you're working on landing rights for some of these flights, at least you were, you have to have some idea of the number of people who've gotten out on charter flights. Can you give us guidance on either of those things? Well, um, we are, again, striving to provide data that uh, is both timely uh, and that is accurate. And um, the data that is most accurate um, is that data that uh, entails operations that the United States government ourselves uh, have facilitated. And so that's why um, we have, uh, until now, uh, spoken um, to the 105 U.S. citizens and 95 LPRs uh, that we have directly, uh, whose departure from Afghanistan uh, we have uh, directly uh, facilitated. Um, we are aware of uh, other uh, U.S. citizens and LPRs uh, who have been aboard uh, private charter flights. Um, we have 
a sense of that from the manifest. Uh, but again, where um, these operations uh, are not ones that we are directly uh, facilitating, um, in the first instance, we have uh, usually less fidelity there. And so we are reticent to um, provide precise uh, figures there. Although uh, in the case of many of these private charters, I know uh, groups have provided uh, their own numbers to give you some sense uh, of, of roughly uh, what this universe may look like. When it comes to uh, the number of Americans who remain in Afghanistan, uh, this is a figure, again, that is dynamic. Uh, we said as of a couple weeks ago, uh, the figure was uh, around 100 Americans in Afghanistan who wished to depart uh, at that time. Uh, this, of course, uh, since then, uh, several dozen uh, Americans have uh, departed Afghanistan uh, with our assistance or uh, via uh, other means. But we're also aware that, again, as we have demonstrated our ability to affect uh, the departure from Afghanistan of Americans who wish to leave, others have raised their hands. Uh, and so this is a number that is changing by the day. Uh, and it is a number uh, that is uh, by no means static. Uh, so. There's dozens, is that? We, we, are, we are certainly in contact with dozens of Americans uh, in Afghanistan uh, who, who wish to leave. But it is, it is difficult for us uh, to put a firm figure on it uh, just because uh, people are departing. Uh, and as Americans in Afghanistan who previously may not have made themselves known to us or previously may have told us, uh, I am content to stay here or I, I'm going to stay here for various reasons, uh, as they see our ability uh, to facilitate the departure uh, of Americans and LPRs. Uh, they are raising their hands for the first time uh, or changing their calculus uh, after, after seeing that. Uh, Afghanistan? Yeah, Connor? Sure. The number that you provided of 105 U.S. citizens and 95 uh, LPRs, that's the same number from about a week and a half ago? That's right. Why haven't, I mean, is, is there been a difficulty getting in touch with people? Why haven't you been able to facilitate more Americans getting out? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of a number of things. Um, there are, uh, there's a, a, a universe of Americans uh, who wish to leave. Uh, there is a smaller universe of Americans uh, who are fully prepared to leave uh, in, uh, in various ways, whether that means uh, they uh, or their family members have travel documents, are ready to leave at this moment. That's a smaller universe than uh, the universe of Americans that uh, we're in touch with that have uh, expressed some desire to leave. Uh, we work closely with our partners uh, on uh, when it comes to flights, when it comes to flights departing Kabul International Airport. Uh, we have continued to work very closely with our uh, cuttery partners uh, on this as well. As you know, they've been able to facilitate uh, the departure of dozens of Americans and LPRs uh, on uh, uh, charters aboard uh, their aircraft. Uh, we've also been able to do this via overland routes. Uh, we are continuing to work with partners uh, and to communicate with Americans on the ground on uh, regarding future opportunities uh, to depart Afghanistan should they choose to do so. Even that number, though, it was a senior State Department official who said that there were about 100 U.S. citizens and LPRs in Kabul ready to go that you guys were, were working with. Did that group get out? Uh, so I believe what you're referring to uh, was uh, just a few days ago um, when, when that senior State Department official made that statement. Um, I, we have, uh, there have not, to my knowledge, uh, been any uh, USG facilitated flights departing Kabul International Airport uh, since then, but this is something that uh, we are always in the background working to arrange with our Qatari partners, uh, working closely with uh, our, our Turkish partners on the, uh, on the ground as well um, when it comes to KIA operations. Uh, and then we're in constant and regular touch uh, with Americans regarding uh, other avenues uh, to depart the country if, if they should choose to do so, including overland. There's apparently, um, can, can you provide any update on the number of Afghans who were evacuated and then have been sort of red flagged um, and had to, to be moved elsewhere? How large is that, that group of people and what your plans are <clears throat> to... Uh, to do with them? I, so I cannot. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security um, may be in a better position to provide you specific figures. What I can say uh, is that uh, the processing, the security vetting that you're referring to uh, is a process that uh, entails uh, reviews by the Department of Homeland Security, uh, by law enforcement, by our intelligence community. 
in many cases, uh, these reviews uh, are able to be conducted expeditiously uh, and result in an all clear uh, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, there have been cases where uh, we have been an, unable to uh, secure an expeditious re resolution of a, a particular case. Uh, in such instances, uh, additional checking does tend to verify that the person is who she or he says uh, they are, and that person is able to continue on uh, with their journey. So sometimes it does take uh, a bit longer, um, but the uh, continuous checks and, and, and vetting uh, in um, nearly all cases that I'm aware of uh, has resulted in, in resolution and, and um, the ability of individuals to continue their travel uh, in relatively short order. Uh, yes, please, slow. Uh, India about uh, Deputy Secretary Sermon's visit to India. What were the key points of a travel uh, visit there? What were the main issues of discussions during her meetings in Delhi? Well, uh, the Deputy Secretary, as you said, uh, has been in India uh, over the past a uh, couple days. I, uh, she is, uh, has just concluded uh, her visit and she will uh, be uh, uh, moving on to Pakistan uh, from there. She has had an opportunity to engage uh, substantively and constructively uh, with uh, some of our key interlocutors. Uh, she had a meeting with uh, the Foreign Secretary, Harsh Shringla. Uh, they uh, discussed, uh, as we often do with our uh, Indian partners, uh, growing security, economic, and Indo-Pacific convergence between India and the United States, um, including uh, around topics that uh, are of mutual interest to both of our countries, ending the COVID-19 pandemic, combating the climate crisis, uh, and accelerating clean energy deployment, uh, deepening trade and investment ties, and expanding cooperation on cybersecurity and emerging technology. Um, we, uh, of course, have worked closely with India uh, over uh, the course of many months now uh, after an announcement that emerged from uh, the first virtual Quad Leader Summit about India's uh, role uh, as a uh, key uh, COVID vaccine manufacturer uh, for uh, the region. Uh, and so this is one of the many areas where uh, we have enjoyed um, a, a deep and collaborative relationship uh, with India. In the course of that meeting, they also uh, discussed uh, pressing uh, regional and global security challenges. Uh, that includes those uh, posed by uh, events in Afghanistan, Iran, Russia, the People's Republic of China. Uh, they also discussed uh, ongoing efforts to return Myanmar uh, to uh, a path to uh, democracy. Um, the deputy also had an opportunity uh, to meet with uh, uh, Indian Minister of External Affairs, uh, D Dr. Jai Shankar. Uh, they discussed uh, some of these uh, same uh, issues, but overall, uh, this was an opportunity for uh, the United States to deepen our strategic partnership uh, with India, a partnership that affords uh, opportunities uh, for both countries, uh, and a partnership that is incredibly important to us uh, as we seek to underscore and to underline uh, a free and open uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, and India, to us, as a member of the Quad, uh, as an important uh, geopolitical partner, um, is an instrumental element uh, to that overarching goal. Yes. On the dates for the 2 plus 2 next month uh, here in DC? I don't have anything to announce in terms of uh, a future meeting. Andrea. Any, any um, better understanding of China's intentions regarding Taiwan after uh, Jake Sullivan's meetings and anything else about the fact that this will only be a virtual meeting between the two leaders rather than an in-person meeting? Uh, what? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so when it comes to Taiwan, uh, let me let me take that uh, first. And you've heard from the State Department, you've heard from the White House on this uh, in recent days, uh, but we are very concerned. Uh, by the PRC's provocative military actions near Taiwan. Uh, as we said, this activity is destabilizing. It risks miscalculations. Uh, it undermines regional peace and stability. And so we strongly urge Beijing to cease its military, diplomatic, and economic pressure um, and coercion against Taiwan. We've said this many times before, but our commitment to Taiwan is rock solid. 
uh, and it contributes, we believe, to the maintenance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait uh, and within the broader region as well. And so we'll continue to stand with our friends and allies uh, to advance our shared prosperity, security, and values. Uh, and we'll continue to deepen our ties uh, with a democratic Taiwan. The other point I would make is uh, one of the elements that I think distinguishes our approach, uh, not only to the PRC, but also uh, our approach to Taiwan, is uh, that it is not uh, something that we are speaking to uh, ourselves. And you have seen over the course of many months now uh, that we have been able to uh, raise uh, the priority uh, of this issue on uh, the agenda. Uh, it featured in the joint statement with uh, uh, Prime Minister Suga uh, in April of 2021 when he visited uh, the White House. It similarly featured in the joint statement after uh, President Moon's visit in May uh, of this year. The G7 communique uh, in June of this year made a reference uh, to the importance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, and the more recent Osman statement from last month, September uh, of this year, says that Taiwan holds an important role in the Indo-Pacific region, and we invite, uh, we invite you to join us in maintaining and expanding strong ties with Taiwan. Uh, so this is something that, consistent with our broader approach to the Indo-Pacific, consistent with our broader approach to the PRC, uh, we have worked concertedly uh, with allies, uh, with partners in Europe, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, around the world uh, to make very clear not only where the United States stands, uh, but uh, also where we stand together uh, with our allies and partners. Uh, yes, Michelle. Sure. Do you have question? anything on the so-called virtual summit? Uh, in terms of uh, the virtual summit, I know that the White House uh, made clear yesterday that uh, President Biden and President, Sh President Xi would have an opportunity uh, to uh, convene virtually uh, before the end of the year, but I don't have any additional details beyond that. Yes. Uh, first, on Libya, the U.S. has been pushing the Libyans to hold the elections on December 24th, but yesterday the parliament has postponed Libya's legislative elections until January instead of being held on December 24th as planned. Uh, are you aware of that? Do you have any comment, and uh, how will you deal with this? Uh, we are aware uh, of that. Um, I, our goal uh, when it comes to Libya uh, is a sovereign, stable, unified, uh, and secure Libya uh, with no foreign interference uh, and a democratically elected government that supports human rights and development and that is capable of combating terrorism uh, within uh, our borders. And so that's why we've increased our diplomatic focus on supporting that progress in Libya. Uh, including through the work of our special envoy, uh, Richard uh, Norland. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, we know that um, elections, free and fair elections, are a core part of that. Uh, there is an urgent need for Libyan leaders to come up uh, with creative compromises on an electoral framework. Um, as we underscored in Berlin uh, in the uh, conference uh, that uh, Foreign, Foreign Minister Moss uh, convened in June uh, and uh, the UN Security Council session on Libya uh, the following month in July, uh, the international community expects uh, national elections uh, to take place uh, uh, in the roadmap adopted by the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum, uh, and we welcome that in UN Security Council Resolution 2570 uh, uh, in April. So the conduct of free and fair uh, elections, holding of free and fair elections, uh, is extraordinarily important to us. Uh, it is something that we will continue to work with our partners in the international community uh, to uh, continue uh, to support uh, as we work to uh, help the Libyan people uh, achieve, achieve their broader aspirations. You prefer both elections, presidential and parliamentary elections, to be held in the same day instead of being uh, held uh, one in December and the second in uh, January? I, I don't know if we have a position on that. If we do, we'll get back to you. Uh, two more. Uh, one on Egypt. A delegation of Egyptian parliamentarians and politicians is visiting Washington this week uh, to discuss human rights in Egypt. 
Did any official in this building uh, meet with the, with the delegation? Yes, I can confirm that our Acting Assistant Secretary for our Bureau, Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs, Yael Limpert, uh, did meet with members of the Dialogue uh, of the uh, Dialogue International Task Force uh, visiting today uh, from Egypt. Uh, we welcome this visit and the opportunity to discuss our ongoing concerns about human rights in Egypt. Uh, the delegation included two individuals nominated by Egypt's parliament to the National Council for Human Rights. That's Chairman Mohammed Anwar al-Sadat and board member and ambassador Mushir al-Khattab. Uh, we have, as we've made very clear, concerns related to human rights in Egypt, and, we, and we've relayed those concerns directly to Egyptian authorities uh, on any number of occasions. Such meetings can provide productive ways to engage on these concerns and show the United States can support, uh, show United States support for Egypt uh, in achieving the objectives set out in its own national human rights strategy, which it launched last month. And uh, last uh, on uh, Iran, it, uh, Iran, uh, Lebanon, a third tanker containing a shipment of Iranian oil destined for Lebanon docked in Syria's Banyas port on Wednesday and they are on their way to uh, Lebanon. Uh, are you aware of that too, and what's your reaction? We are aware of that, uh, and uh, what we would say is that, broadly speaking, fuel from a country subject to extensive sanctions, like Iran, uh, is not, very clearly, a sustainable solution to Lebanon's energy crisis. Uh, we support efforts to find transparent and sustainable energy solutions that will address Lebanon's acute energy and fuel shortages uh, this is, in our minds, Hezbollah playing a public relations game, uh, not engaged in constructive problem solving. What about the sanctions on Iran? Uh, again, there is uh, no change uh, in terms of uh, our approach to uh, these sanctions. Uh, we do not foresee that until and unless uh, we are able to achieve a mutual return to compliance, uh, as we uh, are eagerly seeking to do. Uh, we'll move around, I haven't, please. Um, I have a question about China. Um, there's been a lot of focus on the tone of the meeting yesterday, um, especially compared to the one in March in Alaska. Um, and, you know, people kind of thinking about what that might mean uh, for the U.S.-China relationship and where it's going. So I was hoping you could clarify just kind of a, a fundamental question about where things stand right now, which is, um, has anything at all changed in the U.S.-China relationship and where it's going between that first meeting in March and right now? Well, look, I think there uh, is a mistaken assumption out there uh, that our relationship with the PRC is binary, uh, that either we're in a period of engagement uh, with the PRC uh, or we're in a period of confrontation uh, with the PRC. Uh, that is fundamentally just not how it works. It's at least it's not how it works uh, today. Our relationship with Beijing uh, is one that is dynamic. It is one that is multifaceted. It is one that, at its core, is defined by stiff competition. And the point of uh, this engagement uh, is to see to it that through dialogue, including at high levels, as took place yesterday between the National Security Advisor and Director Yang, to see to it that we can manage this competition responsibly. Um, that is the dynamic that is with us now. It's, we, it's what we expect the dynamic to be uh, going forward. Uh, there are, when it comes to our relationship uh, with the PRC, uh, there are areas of um, competition. Uh, and again, most of our engagement uh, with the PRC is predicated on this idea of competition, and in many cases, uh, stiff competition. It is a relationship that in some ways uh, is adversarial. Uh, and our goal, of course, is to minim minimize uh, these uh, points of, of friction um, in the relationship. Uh, and part of that is engaging uh, construct <coughs> excuse me, constructively in dialogue. <clears throat> with our uh, partners, uh, with, uh, with the PRC. Uh, and there are also areas uh, where there is room for cooperation. And, and we've spoken to some of those areas uh, for cooperation and potential areas for cooperation, uh, working together on climate change, uh, committing to it that uh, we work uh, together, that we work constructively, 
uh, to address the existential challenge of climate change, the existential threat of climate change that poses uh, that very threat, not only to the United States, uh, but also to uh, the PRC. Uh, and it's especially important that we do so uh, when you have the world's largest emitter uh, and the world's second largest emitter um, coming to the table and, and taking responsible action and demonstrating leadership, uh, raising that level of ambition, uh, not only for the sake of our own two countries, but also uh, to galvanize action uh, on the part of countries uh, the world over. So uh, we will, and, and you heard from the White House yesterday, there will be an opportunity for the president to engage directly with uh, President Xi in the coming months. Uh, this is very much part of that belief that in order to manage the relationship, in order to establish and reinforce those guardrails uh, on the relationship, uh, there, needs to be, there needs to be dialogue. It doesn't fundamentally shift uh, the nature of the relationship. It is a relationship that is complex. It is a relationship that is dynamic. It's a re relationship uh, that's multifaceted. And when it comes to the PRC or any other uh, challenge that we face, we can do multiple things at once. Daphne. So could you share a bit more what the U.S. hopes to see come out of the security dialogue tomorrow? Will the U.S. raise Haitian migrants moving to the U.S. border through Mexico, and what will that message be if so? And should we expect any sort of announcement on the Merida Initiative? Uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of tomorrow uh, because uh, tomorrow is another day, um, but also because uh, we are doing a call to preview uh, this engagement um, uh, this afternoon. Uh, I, will, um, I will just say uh, that uh, this dialogue comes at an opportune moment, uh, and it's opportune because uh, the threats of the 21st century are complex, they are dynamic, uh, they are also threats uh, that we need to confront uh, together. These are threats that are transnational. These are threats that, by definition, know no borders. Uh, and so that is why uh, this dialogue, the, the highest level uh, dialogue to date in this administration of, of, of this sort, uh, will build on previous discussions uh, that we've had with our Mexican partners in terms of how to protect our people, how to prevent transborder crime, how to best pursue criminal networks, uh, while also promoting human rights uh, and the rule of law. So we'll have much more to say on this uh, today, and of course, the Secretary and his counterparts will have more to say tomorrow. Uh, Western Sahara. Yes. Uh, the Secretary put out a statement yesterday welcoming uh, Stefan de Mistura's mm -hmm. uh, appointment as the, the, the UN Special Representative <clears throat> in Western Sahara. Um, could you um, go into what you're expecting from this? In terms of his discussions, the U.S. position that Western Sahara is under Moroccan sovereignty, is that is that a position that uh, that is up for review? Is that something you're willing to discuss? What, what do you see? Well, as you heard from the Secretary yesterday, we strongly support uh, personal envoy de Mistura's leadership in resuming the UN-led political process to advance a durable and dignified solution uh, to the conflict in Western Sahara. We will actively support his efforts to promote a peaceful and prosperous future for the people of Western Sahara and the broader region. We remain engaged with all sides in support of that effort and will support a credible UN-led political process to stabilize the situation and secure a cessation of any hostilities. Uh, we are consulting with the parties about how best to achieve uh, that lasting uh, settlement. Um, we don't have anything further uh, to announce at this time. I, as I said, we are consulting uh, with the parties about how best to achieve uh, that lasting settlement. So the U.S. still considers Western Sahara to be under Moroccan, to be legitimately part of Moroccan? We, we don't have uh, any, anything to announce uh, beyond what we've said. Yes? Uh, General, I have a question on China and North Korea. And I seriously think we should talk uh, more about in the Pacific if the United States is serious, seriously think that in the Pacific is important. Uh, so anyway, so regarding China, President Biden uh, said that he and uh, President Xi will abide by a Taiwan agreement. And uh, of course, uh, he meant the, the agreement about Taiwan, but it just caused some confusion and anxiety in Taiwan. So can you just uh, clarify what he meant uh, uh, with that um, with the Taiwan agreement? And my second question is about North Korea. And so the World Health Organization has started shipment of COVID medical supplies to North Korea. And I remember like 
three uh, weeks ago, the U.S. Special Envoy, Ambassador Sung Kim, he said that he was uh, prepared to uh, closely work with North Korea uh, to address the humanitarian concerns. And so do you, uh, can you share any uh, progress on that life front? Uh, sure, I'll take those in turn. First on, on Taiwan, uh, the President, the State Department, uh, we have been clear and consistent uh, that uh, our policy for some four decades now uh, has, um, uh, our, that is to say, our One China policy has been guided uh, by the Taiwan Relations Act, by the three joint communiques, uh, and the six assurances provided to uh, Taipei. Uh, those documents form uh, the basis uh, of our approach uh, to uh, Taiwan and to, to cross-strait uh, relations. Uh, when it comes to uh, North Korea, um, look, we've made this point uh, the world over. Even when we disagree with a particular regime, uh, we believe that we must work to the best of our ability to do all we can to alleviate the suffering of the people. And so we continue to support international efforts aimed at the provision of critical humanitarian aid uh, to the DPRK. It's important to emphasize at the same time that the DPRK regime itself is primarily responsible uh, for the humanitarian situation in the country. The regime continues to exploit its own citizens, to violate their human rights, to divert resources uh, from uh, the country's people, to build up its unlawful WMD and ballistic uh, missiles program. But uh, we do support efforts to alleviate the suffering uh, of uh, the North Korean people. We are involved in efforts to uh, facilitate uh, the provision of humanitarian aid to the neediest in North Korea. Uh, this is most evident, I would say, in our ongoing work to expedite approval, uh, approvals in the UN 1718 Committee uh, for organizations from around the world uh, to, de to deliver life-saving aid to the DPRK. So I have a one follow-up question on that. So yesterday, the UN Special Representative for Human Rights in North, North Korea, he said that uh, Basically, he called on that the UN sanctions against North Korea should be reviewed and eased to facilitate humanitarian assistance. So, and so, can you just clarify how the United States view the relations between the UN sanctions against North Korea and the humanitarian aid? Uh, well, I, I believe he was referring to the UN sanctions regime, not the not the U.S. Uh, sanctions regime. Uh, look, we have uh, made very clear uh, that our policy calls for. Uh, a calibrated, uh, practical approach that seeks serious and sustained diplomacy with the DPRK uh, to make tangible progress that increases the security of the United States, our allies, uh, and our uh, deployed forces. Our goal remains the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And to that end, we remain prepared to meet with uh, the DPRK without preconditions, anytime, uh, anywhere. Uh, we have made specific proposals for discussions with the DPRK uh, in our messages to them, and we hope uh, that they respond positively uh, to uh, our outreach. Again, we support efforts to alleviate uh, the humanitarian suffering of uh, the North Korean people, cognizant uh, that, again, it is uh, far too often the regime that is the cause uh, of that uh, suffering. We also know that our, whether it's our own sanctions regime, whether it's the UN sanctions regime, uh, there are certainly carve-outs uh, in these regimes to ensure uh, that, in the first instance, we are not doing anything uh, that would compound uh, the suffering, the deprivation uh, of uh, the North Korean people. Thank you all very much. We'll see you uh, next week.